Peter Fleming, the British writer, in his uh, Manchukuo travelogue called One's Company, published in 1934, uh, which described his journeys of the previous year, um, gets into this uh, patrol he went on with Japanese uh, soldiers, and here they get into some small towns in Manchukuo. Uh, this one is called Xinpin, and it is um, with the propagandists uh, that he turns um, his attention, to the propagandists rather, that he turns his attention on page 164. I should have mentioned before now the propaganda unit which was attached to the column. Its personnel consisted of a Japanese, a Chinese, and a Korean, all young men, and its equipment of a gramophone, an unlimited quantity of pamphlets, and a lot of medical supplies. When the column halted for the night, the propagandists set about getting an audience. This was where the gramophone came in, for the peasants had never seen its like before. The children were usually the first, in whom curiosity conquered their instinctive distrust of this new magic. They were easily entranced and would cluster around, sucking their fingers and mechanically scratching, while the plangent Chinese music repeated itself in the dusk. After a bit, they would be sent to fetch their elders, and the concert continued until a decent audience had been collected. There followed a brief medical interlude. Purges were administered, cuts, bandages, and the sores, which at least half the children had on their eyelids, treated with ointment. This won the audience over decisively, and the time was ripe for speech-making. The burden of this was usually borne by the young Chinese, a university graduate from Peking. In what seemed to me a very impressive way, he explained to the gaping villagers that they now belonged to a new and independent state, this was news to most of them, to which the Japanese were lending a helping hand. He outlined the principles on which the state was founded and the benefits they would derive from its existence if they pulled themselves together and took a strong line with the bandits. He ended with the inevitable little piece about Wang Dao. The villagers listened with a sheepish but respectful air, continues our author on page 165. It was sufficiently clear that the new government of Manchu Kuo was an institution almost as remote from their comprehension as the London County Council. They were not interested in Wang Dao, but they were unmistakably glad to see the Japanese. Not because they stood for autonomy or any other abstraction, but because they had rifles and plenty of ammunition, and when they came, the bandits, if only for a time, departed. The vast bulk of the 30-odd million inhabitants of Machu Kuo are not, and do not want to be, politically conscious. And it is worth bearing in mind that the fact that a very large proportion of them have never seen a Japanese out of khaki. For there are few parts of Manchuria where a Japanese civilian can travel without military protection. I remember one incident, which I think gives a fair idea of what Manchukuo means to its subjects in the interior. I went with the propaganda men, all of whom seemed to me to be both able and sincere, and to have more elasticity of mind than the regular soldiers. And we went to a school where they were to give a lecture. The children, solemn and scrofulous, sang the national anthem of Manchu Kuo at a funeral pace. The lecture was delivered. Then the chief pupil, a boy of about 18, made a speech of thanks. He had obviously been coached by the master, and everyone obviously thought that he was saying the right things. But he never mentioned Wang Dao or autonomy or any of the other high-sounding things on which the lecturer had concentrated. He talked instead about the Japanese soldiers and nothing else. What fine fellows they were, how good it was of them to come and to clean up the bandits, how glad the village was to see them. The Chinese are realists. And there could be no doubt that we were welcome. Chinese discretion and Chinese hospitality would of course have combined to prevent the display of any marked coldness. But there were incidents. The gift of three puny but precious chickens. The women's readiness to let their children fraternize, which substantiated external impressions.